As an avid bird watcher, you never know what you will see. Over the years, I've seen plenty of amazing birds and behaviors from them. Two Decembers ago though, and a little more than a week before Christmas, I got a rare treat from my area. On one cold and kind of stormy afternoon, as I watched the birds at my feeder, I caught sight of a bird I had never seen before. I looked for a moment and then ran inside to grab my camera. By the time I got back, the mystery bird was nowhere to be seen. I never got a good look, so I never knew for sure what I saw. I scoured the internet for photos to help me identify it, and came across pictures of tanagers and then of Baltimore Orioles. Either one could have been the bird I saw, but it didn't make sense. Living in northern Canada on the east coast, our winters are pretty challenging and very cold. Only the toughest birds dare remain here year-round. Tanagers and Orioles don't live here any time of the year, let alone in winter. This perplexed me, so I continued searching through pictures and came across a bird that made more sense for my location. Red crossbills. Females are yellowish. Something was telling me that wasn't the bird, though. In case it were an Oriole or a Tanager, I brought out some clementines and stuck them on a limb. It wasn't long before the clementines attracted a hungry visitor. Not what I had in mind, a young bull moose. He didn't seem to care too much for them, though, and soon moseyed on his way. The next day, I went to the feeders to see if the bird would show up, but it didn't. It was looking as if I'd never know who that bright beauty was. The day after, I again hung around the feeders in the late afternoon, watching the juncos. Suddenly, out of the blue, a flash of bright yellow caught my gaze. It was back, and I could finally now see that it was definitely a Baltimore Oriole. I was so excited, but that quickly faded when I realized the bird was struggling to eat the seeds and suet I had out. She was going from feeder to feeder, desperately trying to forage, and even went down on the snow. Then she noticed the clementines and tried eating them, but they were frozen. Defeated and succumbing to the cold, she retreated to a limb and tucked her head into her feathers. Clearly this bird was in need of help, but I hadn't the clue what to do. Feeling so sad for her, I wanted to offer some relief, so I grabbed the clementines in my hand and crushed them up as best I could. I wasn't sure how to get it to her, so I just brought them over and the little one eagerly lapped it up from my hand. Not something typical of Orioles. She was obviously desperate. I also crushed up some peanuts for her, which she tried eating too. My hands were freezing, but I stayed. Never ever had I taken a bird inside my home before, but this night, I did. She really liked the dome feeder and even rested on it. With the help of my husband, Jamie, I lowered the feeder down into a box and brought her inside. I put a dish of water and her clementines in with her. Then I put a towel over the dome. The little one slept all night in peace and warmth. I have to admit that I was pretty giddy over the fact I had not only a bird, but a tropical one in my home. It made me feel like a child. While she rested, I tried getting help. I reached out to a rehab and was told by them that there were several sightings of Orioles throughout the province, and there was nothing they could do. I then found a lady who would take the Oriole, but it would only be temporary. I also researched for all the food Orioles like. Jellies are a big hit with them. Jamie helped by making the jellies from dark grapes and oranges. They don't like green grapes. I crushed up peanuts and seeds to make it easier for her to eat them. Oriole bills aren't made for cracking and breaking apart seeds and nuts, but they will eat them if they are crushed up. This would help give her some protein and fat. Lastly, I crumbled up some room temperature suet to help her build fat reserves so she could keep warm. The next morning I found her in the dome feeder inside the box eating her clementine. Wasn't long before she got really upset and tried aggressively breaking out. I was terrified that she was going to break her neck. She seemed much better than she did the day before. 
With everything prepared for her, I put all her food in the dome feeder, as well as some water, all rested in little dishes on top of the seeds for the chickadees and other birds. I don't think they would be too pleased if I never had their food out there too. The little Oriole wanted out, so that's what I gave her. Everyone else across the province was helping Orioles in this way, so I could too. I'd just have to keep an eye on her. With plenty of food, the Oriole seemed rather happy about the new arrangement. Much better than being in a cooped up room, not to mention we had a cat. She stayed all day and was the very last bird to leave that night. The next day, Jamie built her a box for her to hopefully roost in or seek shelter during the day. They are supposedly attracted to the color orange, so we stuck an orange on the outside to advertise it to her. Orioles aren't cavity nesters though, so it's a long shot, and that it was. She never ever did use it. Other people across the province did have success with this though, but the boxes they made were more wide open and not the traditional roosting box style. Every single night I would prepare all of her food. Then at 7.30 every single morning, still dark, I'd go outside with the feeder and wait for her to arrive. She was always the first bird to show up, 20 minutes before 8. I managed to get an Oriole feeder for her, but she didn't care much for it. The dome feeder was her favorite, I guess because it offered her some protection from the elements. Twice a day I'd have to switch out her frozen food for room temperature food once around lunchtime, and again an hour before nightfall. Even with all the food, it was clear she was not made for the cold. She would take many breaks throughout the day to tuck her head in her feathers. It really made me appreciate my hardy northern birds. Luckily for her, the weather turned very warm much easier on her and it showed. She was more perky, lively, and made sure to let other birds know who was boss. Even the larger blue jays played cautiously around her. The chickadees took a liking to her crushed peanuts, so did the juncos. She wasn't having it and made sure to claim her food. I was beginning to have hope for her. If winter could stay mild, maybe I could get her through until spring when she could leave for her breeding grounds. And maybe I could bring her inside on nights that are just too cold and bring her back out the next day. That wasn't to happen though. A few days after Christmas, I went out to give her food like I usually did and she came. Then I went on about my day. Later, when I got back home, I went to check on her, but she was nowhere to be seen. I waited and waited, but she never came to the feeders. I looked around everywhere for feathers or signs of anything that would point toward a hawk, but nothing, and all the birds were acting perfectly normal. When I saw her that morning, she was perky and vibrant. The temperature was very warm all day, and there was no bad weather. Nothing of that nature could be why she was gone. The next morning I went up with her food hoping she would show up, but she didn't. I never ever saw her again. When I think back to the seven very warm days leading up to her disappearance, she started eating a lot and more of the suet than normal. I often wonder if she was taking advantage of the warm weather to build her energy reserves for her getaway out of here. Maybe she did because a week or so later a oriole turned up on the very southern portion of the province. Maybe it was her. Maybe she made it. Maybe my devotion to caring so well for her in those two weeks, along with the break of warm weather, gave her the opportunity to get somewhere a little warmer. I hold on to that idea, and I'm so glad that she found my feeders that cold December day. I know she appreciated the help I offered her. Sometimes she would just come over close to me and just look at me, as if to say, thanks. Why Orioles would end up in a province they never go to, let alone in winter, isn't really clear, but typically it is young or injured birds who left a little later than the others and ended up getting blown off course or lost their way. The Oriole I had did have an injury. Her lower mandible was broken off at the tip. 
It didn't prevent her from being able to eat, though. I never gave up on her. Every day I'd bring out her feeder in case she or another Oriole would show up. The chickadees and chunkos sure appreciated that. I have never seen any more Orioles since that year, but I'm prepared to do all that I can to help one if I ever see an Oriole at my feeders again. There are more touching bird experiences I've had, such as this nest box documentary of Phoebe and Filbert, a black-capped chickadee pair who work tirelessly to provide for and protect their babies. If you're interested, click the link on the screen there now. Thank you for watching. Happy birding. Well into the day, there was still one egg that hadn't hatched. All the nestlings laid over the top of it as if to keep it warm and maybe offer some encouraging words.